This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. In part one, we saw the death of a baby giraffe. Very sad, especially so as the global giraffe populations are down by 38% in the last 30 years. We now continue our story at Lake Naivasha in Kenya, where the giraffes are being squeezed by the flower and vegetable farms around the lake. Whether it's giraffes or kongoni just arrived, or the plants they depend on, or whether it's the grass grazed by a hippo at night to become milk for her baby, or cormorants that build their nests from water weeds. Their food, fish, too depends on the lake, but they prefer to collect that from nearby Lake Naivasha, which has a different kind of water. Delivery looks painful. It's well worth the trip. The huge numbers of pelicans show that. The pelicans fish in unison, and the opportunistic cormorants pick off the extras. But Lake Naivasha's water, which used to be crystal clear, now is not. Filtering papyrus plants have been removed from the shore, and deforestation in the water catchment has caused silting from runoff. Tourists have noticed this and are asking questions. And is there any pollution from chemicals used in the flower farms? And are the supermarkets back home concerned? People certainly come to see giraffe and other game, but a water safari is quite popular too. With a little help from a friendly local guide, Isaac, whose job may depend on the health of the lake. He's concerned about the occupants the fish and the fishermen, whose jobs are also on the line, or in the net. There he comes. Lake Naivasha connects the water with the land, giraffes with fish eagles, and tourists with flower farms like Osarian, and supermarkets like Waitrose, 5,000 miles away. And that connection is 24 hours. A hippo is getting hungry. Soon, he will pull his great weight ashore to feed. But where? As the sun sets, about six o'clock, our giraffe seeks a quiet place. It's not easy, and she's not dangerous. He is. As more and more grazing areas are fenced off, the hungrier he will be. And a hungry hippo is not a happy hippo. Elsa Mir's manager is very careful. It's a squeezed hippo with a powerful ability. Security looks pretty relaxed. He's seen it all before. But Elzamir, originally Joy Adamson's home, provides a refuge for hippos and an exciting place to stay for tourists. Joy's born free for lions hardly applies here today to hippos. Not only is their aquatic daytime home threatened, but their terrestrial larder is denied them more and more. They're very territorial. So are the flower farms.
One zebra made it. No hippo this time. One zebra didn't. A serious game warden helps move the traffic victim. Danger to both driver and certainly zebra. A degrading end for a fine animal. Also, a victim of the squeeze. Its final gift. Life after death as a swallowtail drinks from a zebra's droppings, recycled grass and water. What the grass is waiting for. In fact, the whole landscape is waiting for, and the people are waiting for, is this. How long will it last? Is it the start of the rainy season? Or will it dry up quickly? Climate change? It will affect Assyrian and tourism at its upmarket Chewy Lodge. Certainly the locals on the lake. Because the filth from the slum, where many workers exist, will be washed into the lake. Lovely weather for ducks, maybe. But when the locals go to collect water from the edge of the lake, as they must, they will be repeating a water cycle of personal danger. Soon life returns to normal. Sort of. The old flower fields are flooded. This silt is heading for the lake. Almost overnight, the brown dry areas will turn green and a big, drying out eagle will come hunting. He's on the lookout for prey. A bit of pork might seem the target, but what he sees is invisible to people from the road. In fact, there are quite a few of them pecking about. And a marabou, that big vulture stalk, with a big beak for big business. Millions of winged termites have emerged with the rain, shed their wings and are now desperately burrowing to safety. Millions will die or get eaten. It takes a lot to satisfy the marabous and eagles. But millions too will disperse to start new colonies until the rains come again. But when might that be? Whole communities depend on the weather pattern and that's been changing a lot lately. It will affect the lake nearby, and that will affect everything around it, especially the horticulture. Talk about changes. A few years ago, this giraffe was wading across what looked like an inland sea. Today, most of that water has gone and the giraffe shares the green grazing with the Maasai goats which invaded this new, damp feeding ground. Welcome to a restaurant called Drifters. Hardly afloat, it got even more stranded later when the edge of Lake Naivasha disappeared over the horizon. Hotels like the Sopa Resort used to attract visitors by the proximity to the lake. Not anymore. Water is brought from the lake to the lush gardens, which in turn tempts a rather special visitor to the top of the garden. Bit of a shock if you're on the balcony upstairs, but there's one tree on his mind. This is all a bit disheartening for the gardeners. And something for security to keep an eye on. Giraffe alert! Beware of falling euphorbia.
There's obviously a health and safety issue here when giraffes are as tame as the horses that the tourists ride. But tourists, like flowers, are a big money earner for Kenya. Giraffes are worth their weight in Kenyan shillings. Horticulture earned 32 billion shillings from export in 2009. Neither the giraffe, nor tourism, nor the flower business could survive without this stuff. For local people with no running water, and the Maasai with thirsty cattle through the dust, water is vital to their existence. So how is it, in full view of that busy road, that the very people who claim to be careful with water are allowing this in the heat of the day? What will happen when Lake Naivasha runs out of water? Beyond the dried out pastures, the shoreline is shallow and sticky with silt. Sticky and tricky for a young water bug. Once fish swam here, and fishermen made a living catching them, legally or otherwise. Water buck may turn out to be a misnomer, as they share the now dry land with other wildlife, whose future may now be in trouble as the squeeze continues. The corridor may help some wild animals, but the pressure on the whole region is increasing. The sheer number of people is the problem. The big flower companies employ thousands of workers who need wood, charcoal, food, fish, sanitation and especially water. This is the real cost of a rose. Deforested, now a desert. Desperate people, thirsty animals and a dying lake. Someone who tried to help the situation was Joan Root. She cared enormously about the lake, the fishery, and especially the wildlife around it. Her crowned cranes were devoted to her. They don't drink beer, but love lettuce. She was a vital half of Two in the Bush with film cameraman Alan Root. After they divorced, she lived alone in this sanctuary by the lake, surrounded by flower farms and their increasing populations. Wildlife of all shapes and sizes were her friends, from the tiny dick dick antelope to George, a frequent visitor who pruned the acacias in one of the remaining patches in that part of the lake. But not only were the giraffes being squeezed, but so was Joan herself. At her house, her sanctuary, blood stained this rose. If it were not for the pressures from the flower farms, she would still be alive today. Not far from where we are gathered now, Joan Root was murdered in cold blood. This is the paradise that had attracted Joan and her husband Alan 50 years ago. The dark waters slowly engulfing this country. At Christmas in 2004, I reported it had been a bad year. Many of Joan's friends at the memorial service will remember how the wildlife used to be, a great biodiversity, as we say today. Further along the shoreline, Thompson gazelles and flamingos meet cormorants dropping in, whilst Eland head for shade. A giraffe skips, for some reason, in this Assyrian sanctuary by the lake at the end of the corridor. Enter the lead baboon, heading a veritable army on their wide-ranging quest for anything edible, which is most things. They are frightened of leopards and take evasive action. Don't they know lepers can climb? But they're soon back on the hunt. And now for a really nice surprise. The female giraffe, whose mate we say died in Hell's Gate and fed the vultures, has given birth here in the sanctuary at Osarian. 
but there seems to be a problem. It's a mystery why the mother is rejecting her calf. Her milk is crucial to its survival. The birth cord is still there. It doesn't look good. The male impala is checking his harem his young ones, as they all set off from the safety of the lake, back up the Osarian corridor. The orgo buzzard from his vantage point above the lake watches the pelicans move on across the trees, searching for more water. The recent rain has produced all sorts of new food in the very green grass. Flowers now decorate the hedges. A prickly pear, a reminder that the animals on the move are about to meet people again. But the people, and being on a journey, doesn't deter them. The impala always seem to have family distractions. There's a lot of chasing, calling and tail waving. That can lead to a mass jumping about. Impala males spend a lot of time and energy collecting and maintaining groups of females. Something's up. He warns his wives. It's a jackal who's not interested. His mates are playing. The zebras are nuzzling. As ever, the impalas are competing and two male giraffes are necking. A ritual fight, probably to establish dominance. And then come the inevitable. The impala's efforts paid off. So did the zebras. Yes, they're back at the zebra crossing quite relaxed alongside the traffic. But this cyclist is going to have an interesting ride to work. It's a giraffe crossing. One becomes two. Becomes three. Then four. Then five. How do you move five giraffes? He drops something in the fray. They're behind you. They just keep on coming. After all, it is their corridor, their right of way. In fact, should the flower farms fail, because of lack of lake water, this investment in wildlife may prove invaluable. To see wild animals so confiding, so easily and so close is a privilege. But they can be hazards as we've seen. And baboons simply don't care. Mating in the queue. Yes. 
the corridor can be shared by people and wildlife. Impalas wait patiently for the right time to cross. Historically, local Kenyans have eaten bushmeat as a natural food. Here, both parties seem to have forgotten that, though poaching may increase as bushmeat turns into a business. Giraffe skins can be used to make buckets, and for the tourist souvenir trade, this is an iconic species. But to what extent giraffes can continue to walk the corridor in safety remains to be seen. Such is the people pressure. A solution may, surprisingly, lie in the hands of shoppers in supermarkets thousands of miles away. That's if they find out what's happening to Lake Naivasha and its water. For this young giraffe, the prickly pear hedge is all too effective. But mostly, the migration keeps streaming through. And speed bumps certainly help. Numbers of cattle are increasing again as the rain takes some pressure off the land. The Maasai will always be looking for more grazing grounds and water supply as the squeeze tightens on them and their livestock, to which they are so devoted, and on which they are so dependent. There is only so much grass and water to go round. Although the giraffes have the advantage, they can feed from ground to treetop level. This may not look too lovely to us, but it's just what can turn a male giraffe on. An important signalling device with hints of things to come. Perhaps back in Hellsgate National Park, where she lost her mate too. The only dangerous animals to her here is man. In a sequence of supply and demand, apparently innocent at this time. Behind the green grass, the green houses, squeezing impala and giraffe. Home of the auger buzzard too, amongst the acacias. This now abundant web of life, from multiplying warthogs to millions of migrating white butterflies hatched with the rain, depends on the way the whole watershed is managed. From the rain falling on the Mau forest above the lake basin, to the flower growers and the flower workers that use it, and including, increasingly, steam power, which is derived from the lake water, way below ground. They meet the pylons again. So do the impalas and zebras. They must thread their way between the flower business and the power business. Heading for the safety of Hell's Gate, a protected place, but is it? When the going gets tough, the Maasai go grazing, sometimes in national parks. And the water is a lifeline that stretches all the way from an endangered lake called Lake Naivasha to the supermarket shopping baskets of Britain and Europe. Assyrian flower farms and Waitrose supermarkets are part of that food or water chain and are being held responsible for the lake that Waitrose claim is a sustainable source. It is not. But it could be. Water is the future. In 
no way can a dying lake be considered a sustainable source. But it could be. There is a management plan based on scientific research over 25 years with a budget to repair the lake and help its people and its wildlife. If the water goes, so does the flower business. The jobs, the tourism, and those giraffes amongst much else. When the volcanic ash cloud from Iceland grounded aircraft, thousands of flower workers were laid off and the industry was estimated to be losing two million dollars a day. A rose only lives for a week, so three million blooms were dumped. That is, perhaps, just a warning blip compared with the effect of a dried out lake. In April 2010, it was reported that Waitrose supermarket sales rose 26.9% to £92.2 million. Tesco is thriving too. It would surely be good in the competition that's increasingly green in tooth and claw for a supermarket to be able to say it's saving a lake. After all, their name is on it. As the drought grinds on across East Africa, probably due to climate change, it's possible to see to the future how people, their vital animals and wildlife connect. Further north, long droughts push nomadic tribes and their livestock onto mainly white ranch owners' lands, which up to now have been popular with tourists for the wildlife that's been protected there. And the drought continues. The starving livestock and farmers invade. Ranchers are shot. Making world headlines. It's war and the pressure will surely grow. Tourists won't come to enjoy giraffes, which are indiscriminately shot because they are the reason the ranches have been protected so well up to now for the tourists. The owners of the cattle and goats that are invading don't see what's attractive about a giraffe. Why don't the visitors want to look at a cow? Because it's their wealth, their life, their religion almost. So is there any way both sides can win, or at least not lose? <laughs>